Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about hardware, composer hardware specifically. I've been asked by a lot of people to do videos on what hardware I'm using, what software I'm using, what libraries I'm using, to give a run through of my template, all that kind of stuff. So I've, I'm starting to do this. Um, so today we're going to be starting with my computer setup, audio interface, MIDI controller, whatever I have at my studio currently. Um, just so you can get an overview of how big or really how small a professional setup can be. So let's start with the computers. What I like to do and what I have been doing for a couple of years now is I've been using two computers. One computer is completely dedicated just to stream samples. It runs VE Pro and that's really all it does. It does nothing else. And then I have a host computer which essentially um, runs the DAW, it runs the picture. I also use it for gaming, hence the PC. And it, it runs all the heavy stuff. I would load synthesizers onto that machine. Um, it, it does all the processing, it does my video work. So that's really the main machine that is doing the heavy lifting processing wise. This is a very common setup that I've seen at a lot of studios really that I've worked at. Some composers have more machines connected, but with the current power, I think you don't really need it. You don't need more than two machines. In fact, I know a couple of people that just use one machine at this point. The new Mac Pro that just came out, but also if you're in PC land, building a really powerful AMD Ryzen machine might do the trick for you. I still don't think it's probably wise to do that with heavy orchestral templates, but it certainly works if you're doing a lot of synthesizer heavy stuff. You can totally do that on one machine. It's just going to be one gigantic expensive machine pretty much instead of two medium expensive machines. And you can do this on any system. You can combine a Mac and a PC, which is what I've been doing for the past, I think, 10 years. But you can also do PC and PC. You can do PC and Mac or Mac and Mac, though I don't think I've ever seen that because, I mean, that would be really unnecessarily expensive to just have a Mac do some sample streaming because these machines are really more expensive than PCs. So the most common I've seen is Mac as a host machine and then a PC as a sample streaming machine. But currently, I, as I just mentioned, I switched from Mac to PC to PC and PC for a variety of reasons. I'll do a separate video on Mac versus PC because I just switched and, you know, I, I can talk about that, um, but that's going to be a different thing because that can also go south real fast when all the PC fanboys and fangirls and all the Mac fanboys and fangirls come out of the gutters and start discussing this stuff. I have no particular preference to either. I'm still using Mac products and I'm, I've been using PC products for almost all my life. So it's kind of like asking someone what's the better DAW. You know, whatever works for you and whatever you can afford really. So this is my current setup. I'm going to put the, all the specific parts in the description so we don't have to get into all of that. I currently have a VE Pro sample server. I've had that, this particular one since 2017, so it's slightly older. Um, it has 64 gigabytes of RAM uh, with the option to upgrade to 128, but I haven't needed that yet. It has plenty of SSD space. It has plenty of regular 7,200 RPM hard drive space. I like to divide my libraries onto different types of hard drives. It's usually better to not stream everything from one big hard drive, but rather stream it from multiple smaller hard drives, just so you don't stress out one hard drive too much and then it'll die sooner. We don't want that, especially if it's regular hard drives. With SSDs, you can kind of neglect that a little bit, but with regular hard drives that have these little reading heads, if they're running at full capacity all the time because you're running all of your samples from the same hard drive, they're just going to break much quicker. And you're going to have more power if you run it from multiple hard drives. And frankly, regular hard drives are so cheap these days, even the faster ones, that there's no need to run everything from one hard drive. You will basically have double the power if you say, okay, I'm going to load my string samples from this hard drive and I'm going to load my brass and woodwind samples from another hard drive and then I'm going to 
load the percussion and other stuff from a third hard drive. It'll just offload a lot of the extreme pressure that is put on these hard drives because sample streaming is just very hard on hard drives because it's so many little files. It's constantly running at max speed. So by dividing it onto several hard drives, you're kind of taking the pressure off. It's kind of like now the hard drives are running a marathon instead of a sprint, and so they will not tire as easily. It's kind of the best I could come up with, I suppose. But in any case, that's what that machine is doing. It doesn't have a snazzy graphics card in it, because I never look at that machine, so why waste money on that? It doesn't have the fastest processor, because I don't do a lot of... Um, synthesizer stuff that would need that and usually if I do I load that onto my main machine. So this machine is definitely cheaper than the main machine if you're using it the way I'm using it because most of the parts don't have to be high-end. It doesn't need a ton of connectors. It needs a bunch of USB connectors for iLocks and e-licensers and that kind of stuff and it needs um, an ethernet port but I don't even think we put a Wi-Fi port into that or anything else. It doesn't have some very basic ports just because I don't need it on that machine. And then we have the host machine, which also has 64 gigabytes of RAM currently because RAM is cheap if you don't buy it from Apple with the option to upgrade to 128 gigabytes of RAM. Um, it also has plenty of hard drive space, two regular hard drives and then um, two SSDs one for the operating system and then one for you know the heavier sample libraries. I tend to have four hard drives in my machines, also in my old Mac, just because one is dedicated just for the OS, two are really dedicated for samples, and then one is dedicated to projects, project files, picture files, and all that stuff. But you can, you can do that however you see fit, however it works for your system. Now my host machine has a pretty snazzy graphics card in it, um, mainly because I use it for gaming, uh, but also because I do my video work on that. It plays back the video as well of my scoring, so it needs to be a bit better than what is in the server machine. The processor, much more powerful, uh, partially because I'm running synthesizers from that machine, but also because I'm running the DAW and the picture and a lot of stuff at the same time from that machine. It needs to be able to do a lot of multitasking, which the server machine doesn't really need to do. So this one has a much more powerful processor in it. And it also has way more connectors, um, because that will be the machine that will need the extra video card or the extra audio card. That's going to be the machine that will need more peripherals attached to it that will need the audio interface and all that stuff that will need the MIDI controllers connected to it. So I just make sure that it has a lot more connectors to it than the server machine that doesn't really need any of that. So as I mentioned, the V Pro machine can turn out to be way cheaper than the host machine, but if you're on PC, neither one of them are particularly expensive. Uh, I think the server machine was 2400 or something and the host machine since i bought all the parts during black friday last year um it's it was 28 or 2900 so it wasn't particularly expensive actually compared to a mac with those specs would be insanely expensive even both computers combined would not amount to the same amount of money as the new mac pro you could build a more expensive machine but even even if you build a pc that is four grand. I mean, then you have a really snazzy machine with all the best parts on the market. Maybe, maybe someone will find a way to go up to five grand, but I mean, I dare you to build a PC more expensive than that, even with all the best parts on the market, because they don't use the Apple certified parts that unfortunately are always marked up in price. So, you know, take that as you will. So before this, before I switched fully to PC, I was working on the old 2010 and 2012 Mac Pros. I had two of them. The 2012 one died last year, which was basically the prompt for me to buy parts. And at that point, they hadn't quite told us yet that they were coming out with a new Mac Pro because I wasn't going to buy the trash can because I have worked on the trash can Mac Pro at other people's studios and it did not impress me. 
um, especially with all the peripherals that you need to run. And uh, it, it, it was always a nightmare to work with, especially if you have other stuff that needs to get connected to it. So I wasn't going to go for that. So the new Mac Pro um, came out after I had already made the decision to switch to PC. But frankly, after I saw the price tag on the new Mac Pro, I, that also would have sealed the deal for me to go to PC. But again, that's going to be a different video. I'm not going to talk about that too much now. So for a long time, I was on the 2010 and 2012 Mac Pro and they, they did their duty. They couldn't be upgraded anymore at this point, but um, they had pretty much the same specs. I had the 12 core processor. I had four hard drives in it. You can also put SSDs into those machines if you want. You just need to buy a little adapter. It had whatever graphics card came with it that is now completely outdated. I was never impressed with the graphics cards that they put into these machines, to be honest. There was always a bit of a shortage of USB connectors, as is any Mac. I don't know why. <laughs> why Why can't you give us more USB connectors? Um, but, you know, it's fine. You can buy adapters and splitters and whatnot. But yeah, that, that was essentially that machine. And it served me really well for a while with 64 gigs of RAM. I think you can go to 128 in those machines as well. So that's great. But they're getting old, they're getting slow, they're outdated. So um, one of them already broke. So it's not really, it wasn't really feasible to keep them around for much longer. So once we get past the computers, um, the next thing I have is an audio interface, of course. I have the um, Focusrite Scarlett 6i6. I just got that actually, and I'm incredibly happy with it. It's a top-notch audio interface. I had the uh, PreSonus audio box before that. It's a great starter audio interface if you need one desperately. Uh, not my favorite thing in the world. It also didn't play very nicely with um, PC. I also think it is discontinued now, but I might be wrong about that. And I've, I've worked with the uh, Focusrite products before, and I'm, I'm a huge fan. It has a better preamp, definitely. It has more controls, more inputs, outputs. I mean, I, I like it very, very much. It comes with really snazzy um, driver software. Yeah, I, I can only recommend that brand. I've also worked with their smaller interfaces and they are awesome as well. Of course, if you want to go for something bigger that also requires an audio card inserted into your machine, you can go with the UAD, you can go with the Apollo, you can go with the Avid interfaces. Um, there, there's plenty out there that is higher end. If you're using a lot of hardware reverbs or hardware effects or hardware synths, you might want to do that, or if you record larger ensembles, that's probably your way to go. But for me, that's not really necessary right now. I, I will get it in the future, but for now, I'm not doing the, a lot of the stuff that I would need that for, so it doesn't really make sense to buy that right now. Then my MIDI controller right over there is the Akai, um, I think it's the MPK. It's the MPK-88. A lot of uh, studios here have that because it has a really nice weighted feel to it. If you're a pianist, you're gonna probably like this. It has some, some nice feel to it in uh, when you're playing. And it comes with a lot of faders and controllers. I don't actually have a fader unit or smaller controller on my desk, but I'm actually uh, going to rectify that because this larger controller is great for composing and finding ideas and stuff and, and playing actual piano parts or, you know, any type of keyboard instrument. But it's not super great for if you want to make quick changes or you quickly want to play something in, then it kind of becomes a bit of a hassle. So I'm actually looking for a smaller controller unit that I can also have on my desk in front of me. Now, uh, another thing that I have is I have these Alesis speakers. They are essentially just basically a hand-me-down from a colleague from years ago. I think they're probably 20 years old now or something. They're still working. They're not working well anymore. The reason why I'm not replacing them is I don't have a properly treated room and I'm not using the speakers that much um, because I mostly work on headphones and I know a lot of people are now going to go, whoa, and why do you do that? A lot of composers work on headphones. 
partially because some people at the studios are sharing rooms, so they have to be on headphones, but also a lot of people just prefer good quality headphones. A lot of people don't have properly treated rooms and it, it costs a ton of money to do that. So you're actually better served by buying a, an expensive pair of headphones. So the ones that I'm using are the Biodynamics uh, 880s. They are the most common I've seen at studios around Los Angeles. Uh, very preferred by composers who do orchestral music, I think. But the equivalent for, to that on the Sennheiser part is the HD 660s and 650s that I've seen a lot of the time as well. What you want to make sure is that you get open back or semi-open headphones so that they are fairly linear and obviously you want to go with high quality headphones. So these are the Biodynamics 880s and 990s or the Sennheiser HD 600 or 650s are the ones that I've seen the most at Composer Studios. Um, and all of them are open back or semi-open back. Now, I know a lot of people will make the argument that it's not the same as speakers. Yeah, it's not the same, but I have yet to mix a piece that didn't translate properly to speakers that I've done on these headphones. In fact, some of my mixes were better on these headphones than they were on proper speakers. Because I think you hear more detail on those headphones, they're comfortable, and since they're open back, they don't put a ton of pressure onto your ears. Actually, some of the best mock-ups and mock-up mixes I have heard in Los Angeles were made on headphones. Some of the best mock-up artists that I know that work for, you know, the biggest games and the biggest composers do work on headphones. And especially right now, it's super handy because a lot of people are working from home, so don't discount this. I'm, I would not ask a mixing engineer to work from headphones, of course not. Especially if it's for a theatrical surround mix or something, no. But if you're a composer and you need a decent mixing setup, this is completely valid. In fact, sometimes I've had it that um, I get back mixes from mixing engineers and I'm hearing details that they didn't hear on their speakers. So... I would even urge mixing engineers to ref check their mixes on headphones because you hear little noises and frequencies that you don't necessarily hear on speakers. I also like the 880s because you can, you can do tracking with them um, if it's just one person because the click bleed isn't that strong. But what I like to use them for is actually when I conduct sessions because since they're only semi-open, the click bleed isn't strong enough to be on any microphones and so I can have both ears covered. I will still hear the orchestra through them, but I will also hear the mock-up in stereo and it makes for a much better blend and better judgment while I'm conducting without being in the booth. So I like them for that as well. And ultimately you're going to save a lot of money because these headphones that I mentioned are in the $300 range. You're not going to get a high-end pair of speakers and room treatment for that price. I know some people who go even higher and really buy $1,500 headphones. I mean, go for it if you want to spend that kind of money. But that's still going to be cheaper than a decent pair of monitors plus room treatment. So it is the cheaper option. And for me, it was also important because I was an assistant for a couple of years and I was going to different composer studios and they all have different rooms, they all have a different setup, they all have different speakers. So it was really difficult for me when I was doing mock-ups to stay consistent in my quality. So I would just bring my pair of headphones that I know, because that's really the key, know your equipment, and I would bring them to the different composer studios and work on my headphones to get the same quality in my work and then I would ref check on their speakers and it always perfectly translated. So again, don't be scared to work on headphones. There's also a company, Sonoworks. They have a plugin, even specifically for headphones, but also for speakers and such, that will calibrate your setup to be completely linear so that you get an even better playback experience. I haven't done it yet, but colleagues of mine have done it and I will actually get that plugin because it seems like a really nice idea to um, calibrate your speakers and headphones to sound linear. And if you need to do a surround mix on headphones, you can even do that with a Waves plugin that is specifically for surround mixing on headphones. I haven't tried that yet, but I've had 
colleagues of mine try it and it actually translated really well into a 5-1 surround system. So again, don't discount headphones as something that you can't use for mixing and composing and doing mock-ups because I would say at least 50%, if not way more than 50% of the people at the studios I've worked at have been on headphones. And at the end of the day, think of the end consumer. Of course, if something goes to a theater, you want the mix to be done in a proper Dolby certified surround system and everything, fine. But the end consumer is going to most likely consume your product on their iPad, on their phone, on their home system, on headphones. So you always want to make sure it translates anyway. Even if the movie is successful and it has a two month theatrical run, after that, everyone is going to consume your stuff most likely in stereo and most likely on headphones, really. So the next thing I have in my setup is a battery backup. This is important. If the power goes out, you need a backup that kicks in and keeps your machines running at least long enough that you can save everything you've been doing and then shut down the machines safely. It also prevents any surges that happen during a power outage or, you know, in Los Angeles we have these heat waves and the power goes a little bit crazy when everybody turns on their air conditioning and, you know, it just gets a bit nuts sometimes. So it's good to have a battery backup, not just to prevent power surges, but also when the power goes out, you lose nothing. I mean, how often has it happened that the power goes out and you lose everything that you've been working on? So get that battery backup. For a system that I just described, you need just a battery backup that is probably $130, $150. You need to exchange the battery once every five years or so. Uh, one of mine actually just went out, so I need to exchange that battery. Be careful when you do that, by the way. These things are very powerful batteries, so you don't want to touch it the wrong way. Be careful when you exchange that. Or, you know, wear rubber gloves and stuff. You know, be safe with battery backups is what I'm saying here. But get one. Get a battery backup. It's really, really, really important for any professional to have that. Usually they have two sides, at least the ones that I've seen for myself, but also at different studios, is the one side is the actual battery backup. So that's where you plug in all the stuff that you want still powered on when the power goes out. And then the other one is surge protected. So that's all the stuff that, you know, that can go out in a power outage, no harm done, but you still want to protect it from any power surges. Then you want a backup system. Have a backup system. Can be a RAID system, can be a separate hard drives. I use separate hard drives for it. You know, it's not the most sophisticated way of doing it, I admit. It's kind of an old system that I still have, but um, there's plenty of software that can run the backups for you. Also, if you're on a Mac or a PC, run Time Machine backups or um, OneDrive backups or whatever PC is offering. Run online backups. That's what I do first before I do the hard drive backups, but have a system in place that gives you at least two backups on top of the one that you have on your machine. So I will have a copy of all my files on an internal hard drive, then I will have an online backup that is made automatically, and then at the end of a project when I archive, I make a copy onto an external hard drive. There's also the theory of having an off-site backup, which I suppose would be an online backup, but there are people who actually make physical backups onto a hard drive and then they put it in a safe somewhere. I suppose I would do that if I worked on a $200 million production. That's probably wise to do. But um, if you're not working on those movies, it's probably fine to have an online backup and a physical backup. And then something else I have is an external hard drive reader for internal hard drives. So you can take any SSD or hard disk and just plug it in. You can take it out of a computer and then plug it into that thing in order to read it. It can also make clones, so if you have two slots you can put two hard drives in it and then clone from one to the other. I find that to be helpful when I want to make a clone of my internal system drive or a sample drive or a projects drive. 
it's kind of faster than doing it through the network or you know copying files over manually or if you have system files that need to be copied. If you really want an exact clone, I find that super useful. I always found it useful to do between the Macs because one of my Macs was always turned off or most of the time turned off, but I wanted to keep the system drive updated with all the changes I was making. And so instead of booting it up and then connecting it to the network and then copying the time machine files or something like that, what I would do is simply take out the system drive, put it into the external reader and then just make a clone. And that's pretty much it for, my, uh, for all of my hardware. I don't have a ton of hardware. Uh, it's a fairly minimalistic setup. I've worked on much bigger setups at other Composer Studios. Not a fan. I'm not a fan of big, heavily wired um, studios with a ton of hardware stuff, a ton of gear that is hooked up. First of all, at any studio that I've been at, half of that gear wasn't even being used. It was just sitting there. But also, um, most of what was being used was just causing problems. And I don't want to spend half of my time troubleshooting my computers, troubleshooting my hardware. I want it to just work. And so the most joyful experiences were at mostly younger composer studios that had this two computer setup. It's super common now in the millennial generation and the generation above. And then if you go one generation further, they all still have these super complicated setups. And again, not a fan. It just, most of them have a tech on staff full time to just keep that stuff running. And I find it personally unnecessary. Of course, again, if you work on the $200 million movies, yes, there's a justification for that. But if you're just a regular composer like me and you work on mid-level productions so far, I mean, hopefully I will move up at some point. But currently I'm working mostly on mid-level productions and those don't require that type of setup. It's just too crazy. So don't go super nuts on, you know, all the hardware and all the stuff. If you have these basics that I just mentioned, you have a pretty snazzy... Uh, studio in order to work on mid-level productions that have orchestral live recording and everything. Um, you don't need the massive setup in order to do this. And you don't need the massive setup to do really great orchestral mock-ups at this point. So don't stress out about it. What I would discourage you from doing is getting computers that you can't open, which rules out a lot of Apple products, I know. I would try and avoid working on laptops. They're not made for this kind of stuff. Even the really snazzy laptops, they're not made to be stressed out like this at all times and they will break. Don't work on your internal hard drive that is running the OS. Just let that run the OS and the programs, but don't stream samples from that and do that kind of stuff. Just don't do it, especially because samples tend to wear out hard drives faster and they will die and then your system drives with dies with them but generally try to buy machines that you can open and fix that you can have spare parts for i have spare parts in my closet for everything just in case and the stuff that i don't have spare parts for i can drive to the next fries or best buy or whatever electronic store is nearest me and just get those parts or get similar parts that will work for that system. Or you can, of course, do Amazon overnight delivery or something like that. You know, there are solutions for that if your system breaks and you need it fixed within 24 hours. Because that's always, that's my biggest fear. What if I'm 24 hours away from a session, I still have to print stems and prepare Pro Tools sessions and do all this stuff and my system goes down? It has happened. And it was, you know, a sample drive that went down, but I had a clone in my closet. So it took me roughly one minute to power down the machine, push in the new hard drive, and everything was fine. So that's really what you want to achieve with your system. It needs to be flexible, it needs to be easily fixable, and it needs to be safe. I hope this was helpful. Next time I'll go over my template and sample libraries and whatnot, but this is it for the hardware part. Let me know if you have any questions, drop them in the comments, and I will try to answer.